Okay, I think now would be a great time to get started. Um, so welcome everybody again. I am Jason Vardikar. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford University. Um, but I am also a curator of special projects at the Hunter and Art Museum. And today I'm here to present an artist lecture series and conversation with me by the artist Lauren Eckert, whose work in, media, in the media of jewelry and digital illustration and sculpture, I think you'll find is thought provoking and challenges even regresses our assumptions about the aesthetics of technology and craft. This free event is part of a series hosted by the Hunter and Art Museum in conjunction with the fall 2020 exhibition From the Ground Up, Peters Valley School of Craft, curated by Elizabeth Esner. For that exhibition, resident artists have been making their work in the first floor galleries of the museum um, October through December. And this month, Lauren Eckert has been in residence. I encourage everyone who's attending today to safely see this excellent exhibition, which is up through January 10th at the museum. Uh, I wanna take a moment to thank our funders. This program was made possible in part by a grant from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, a state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional support for this exhibition was provided by the Windgate Foundation and the Marie and John Zimmerman Fund. Museum programs are made possible in part by funds from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, a partner agency of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and many other corporations, foundations, and individuals. Thank you. So Lauren Eckert is a multimedia object maker, illustrator, and art conservator based in Philadelphia. Her work has been exhibited in venues such as Museum Arnheim in Amsterdam, Aeromont School of the Arts and Crafts, the Form and Concept Gallery in Santa Fe, the New York City Jewelry Week, and the Peters Valley School of Craft. In 2018, Eckert curated the show, The Virtual Hand for Temple University. Eckert attended Tyler School of Art, Temple University in Philadelphia, where she received her bachelor's of fine arts in metals, jewelry, CAD CAM in 2019. So thank you, thank you very much, Lauren. And um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you for you to give your presentation to us all. Thanks, Jason. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. So thank you all for joining me to hear about my work and thanks to the Hunter and Art Museum for giving me a platform to share my work. Um, my website is on the bottom left of the slide and my Instagram handle is on the bottom right if you want to take a look at more of my work or talk to me in the future. Um, so the metals, jewelry, and CAD CAM program at Temple University is very technology focused. Uh, so I became very interested in computer aided design Combined with my love of science fiction movies, my artwork centered around a lot of the concepts and aesthetics of technology and speculative fiction. Uh, seen here is a still from one of Space Odyssey, which was directed by Stanley Kubrick and um, was a really large initial inspiration for me. I love how sci-fi, I love sci-fi for how imaginative it is and sometimes for the existential horror of the genre. Uh, so I created this series titled A Virtual Body using funds awarded to me through my Shapeways Education Grant and a merit stipend from Temple University. The forms are inspired by medical imaging equipment, early smartphone designs, and video game controllers. The pieces have both a tangible component and a hologram that uses augmented reality technology and QR codes. Augmented reality is a technology used for Instagram face filters and in popular video games like Pokemon Go. The tangible components are entirely 3D printed, and you can see how the high contrast production designs of 2001 is present in my own design. The tangible and virtual components represent the dual experiences of existing in both a tangible and virtual world. 
I was thinking about how my experiences and other people's experience of me is influenced by my digital self on the internet. This photo shoot was part of a workshop with the contemporary jewelry magazine, Current Obsession at Temple University. Learning how to do art direction was really engaging and finding other ways to create a brightly colored and artificial environment was really enjoyable for me. So in school, my professors, Doug Bucci, who was also in the front the ground up exhibition and Mallory Weston taught me how to anodize titanium. And I combined my love of a bright color palette with my sci-fi inspired form language. I started using computer aided design and a hydraulic press to create these faceted bubble forms that reference that futuristic aesthetic. These pendants also have very geometric and strong silhouettes influenced by imagined curves, corners and fleek contours. And so this piece, this pendant right here is made of titanium and the color you see is from the anodizing process um, and it's titled Xenon, uh, which was kind of a reference to the early Disney movie um, with the character Xenon. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I love sci-fi illustration for the glossiness and the bubbly and dynamic form language. Metal infrastructure is a big part of the aesthetics of both utopian and dystopian worlds. And I wanted to reference that. This is where I started loving illustration when I was looking at science fiction illustrations for inspiration. This piece really evidences the spaceship inspired silhouette. And a few people have told me that it reminds them of old video, the old video game Atari Space Invaders. I chose the ball chain and screws as findings for their industrial look. And as with other pieces in the series, the corners are all curved and the metal is polished to a satin finish to allude to that sleek retro futuristic idea of technology. So the anodizing process is one of my favorite parts of titanium, like I said. It happens fast, so there's an element of instant gratification and it looks scientific, so it makes for a fun demonstration. It works by running an electrical current through the metal and depending on the amount of electricity, you can get different colors. This video runs through the whole spectrum of colors, but it's sped up a little bit. Um, and I used to do demonstrations for high schoolers as part of a program with Peter Jolly. And this is what I would always do because it kind of combines the science and art for them. So I was the Peter Jolly Fine Metal Studio Assistant in the summer of 2019. That was my first job after graduating from Tyler School of Arts Metals program. Um, and I was assisting, assisting with all the workshops that summer. And I learned so much and I fell in love with the school and the natural beauty of the Delaware Water Gap. Some of my favorite workshops I participated in that summer were steel fabrication with Lynn Batchelder and tool making with Anna Koplick. And I have pictures from both of these workshops right here. The one on the right is my um, forge, the coal forge for my uh, blacksmithing in the tool making workshop. And then the one on the left is me making a steel curb chain um, in the metal studio. And I'm, you can see me wearing my Peter's Alley apron, um, which I still have and uh, love. <laughs> um, so this is a GIF from Hyperlight Drifter. I'm also an illustrator, which started when I realized how much I was uh, drawing inspiration from other illustrators, and I wanted to make my own. Illustrators are great at world building, and I had to begin to imagine all of my artwork together in their own world, like some sort of separate atemporal dimension. I wanted to start building that place by drawing and collaging it. My style is inspired by a lot of 8-bit pixelated styles of video games. Older video games like Pokemon Zelda, and newer video games like Hyper Light Drifter and Stardew Valley. Uh, was a collection of digital collages printed on fabric scarves. In elementary school computer class, we have this drawing program called Kid Picks that was basically Photoshop for children. <laughs> um, it came with a whole package of pre-existing brushes and stickers that had this candy coated neon pixelated style. And I leaned into the frenetic vibrance of it because it reminded me of the fantastical elements of my titanium and digital creations. We were supposed to be doing typing, when we were supposed to be doing typing lessons, I would usually be playing around on this program instead just filling the screen with as much content as possible. Feeling nostalgic, I re-downloaded the program and started using its distinctive style to make collage components that I then arranged using Photoshop. This was one of the first I made and all the gems are kind of a reference to my jewelry background. So then I had, after Peter's Valley, I had a residency in uh, Houston at the Houston Center for uh, Contemporary Crafts. And then this was the first brand new artwork I made there. And you can see how the color palette is kind of similar um, to the scarves. So I wanted to bridge the gap between my 8-bit illustrations and my metalworking. So I decided to try weaving the titanium so each little woven square would be visually similar to a square pixel, like the pixelated style of my childhood art program. 
I've seen woven metal before with silver and copper, but not titanium. And I thought the anodized colors would provide a bright contrast that has similar visual effects to my, and palettes to my drawings. Also, I started working with mild steel as a skeleton for all these elements because of how much I enjoy working with steel at Peters Valley. So um, remember when you were like, a, when people were children and I would, and you would rub your hands all over the TV screen static, similar to the child in the movie Poltergeist. Uh, I did that a lot. <laughs> After proving my concept with my first woven pixels piece, I was thinking about the density of digital images. I wanted to make the weaving even tighter to give it a staticky feel like this image. So this is my second woven pixel piece, which I also made in Houston. And I doubled the density of the weave and made this miasmic cloud of digital static. If you run your fingers over the metal, it almost feels like the zesting side of a cheese grater. So it has a nice texture too, similar to when I would touch the TV screen. <laughs> the size of the base plate is about the limit of what my machine can anodize, which another reason I like titanium is because it's not very dense. So I can make really lightweight pieces relative to the amount of material I'm using. So if this was in like silver or steel, it would be very heavy, but because it's in titanium, it's actually pretty light. So after testing out my colorful woven titanium and being satisfied with the results, I added some other elements to create this piece. While a wearable necklace, it's more of a wall object that hangs from these two 3D printed claws I designed. I'm using my woven titanium as a decorative element that still creates a digital futuristic impression, but also, has, but also as a mechanical element and cool connection between the steel and titanium geometric forms. I wanted this piece to be something you would arrive at in the midst of a fantastical journey, maybe part of some imaginary castle or cavern as an object that could be some sort of loot that maybe could serve you as an amulet of protection or maybe even sets off a trap when you remove it. Um, so this is a still from the Legend of Zelda Link to the Past game. Um, and the idea of arriving at the piece comes from the piece that I just showed, comes from video games where the player would maybe find armor or important items in certain rooms in the dungeons. Video games are really interesting to me as an illustrator because there's lots of world building and lore and creatures and characters. And as a craftsperson, there's lots of interesting objects that can help your character along. There is material culture in video games that's not constrained by the tangible or real. So here's a closer photograph. Um, and you can see my woven elements more and how they connect all the different steel and titanium hollow forms. Uh, you can see I'm using more steel in this piece too, which is the black metal. This, over, this is overall a darker, heavy color palette, but I'm still including those maximalist colors of the titanium as a focal point. This piece is where I started moving towards fantasy mythology and folklore as sources of inspiration, rather than only science fiction, uh, with the addition of my quad, quad elements that hold the piece to the wall. I wanted the piece to come from a combination of future and past, which is also why I named the piece Synthetic Relic. So uh, this is Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch's The Last Judgment. Um, and I like Hieronymus Bosch and medieval artwork depicting religious imagery, uh, which is just full of symbolism and mortal terror and chaos. At this point in my Texas residency, COVID really started taking over and Houston had a stay at home order in place. So I couldn't access any of my metalworking tools and uh, continue the series that I had planned on when I was doing there. Um, so I decided to focus on my illustrations and make a big grand triptych similar to uh, Bosch's The Last Judgment or um, other paintings of his like the Garden of Earthly, Earthly Delights. So uh, using my childhood drawing program, I made a bunch of elements to later collage including a bunch of these amorphous creatures with human-like features. I also created this large gateway as the portal to my new world. And I'm doing a lot of research into mythology and folklore while making these two. For example, the bottom metal object is based on a dowsing rod, which is a divination tool used to find underground water. In folklore, spirits and magic aren't able to cross over sources of water like rivers and streams. So including a dowsing rod inspired tool in my triptych is a reference to searching for that type of border. The bottom left and the bottom left and top right creatures are knees who punished mortals for crimes in the underworld. The top left and bottom right creatures are more eldritch and unknowable, similar to biblical depictions of angels or Lovecraftian horrors. So here's my triptych. I collaged all of my elements together into this finished piece. It's quite large at 36 inches tall. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted the top to have a more heavenly aura and color palette 
with the light uh, blues and yellows and pinks. And the bottoms have a chthonic underworld atmosphere with like dark reds and purples and dark greens. All of the icons are chosen intentionally to create different environments throughout the piece and some reference specific mythologies too. For example, the scissors in the middle panel uh, right near the, the great gateway to the left and right of it are uh, akin to the scissors that the three Greek deities called the Mori used to cut the string of a mortal fate. The middle panel is more centered on searching, remembering, and finding this gateway to this fictional world with keys and lots of birds. A symbol of psychopomps, which is a type of spirit that will guide souls to the afterlife. The two other panels are divided by their contents, the left being more natural imagery like plants, animals, and fire, or the myth. Uh, the light being more material imagery like gems, potions, and scales, or the material plane. These are two sides of this world, similar to how material and spiritual are opposites. So after coming back from Houston, this is the first piece I made after returning home from my Houston residency and having access to my entire studio again. So I decided to make something really big. This is the third synthetic relic. And I decided to make a pendulum because pendulums are often tools, are tools often used in divination rituals and huge pendulums have always seemed kind of spooky to me. This could also be some kind of mace-like weapon in the world, in the weird atemporal world that my artworks exist in. The facets of the pendulum remind me of puzzle boxes like the one in the Hellraiser movies that the main character uses to open the gateway to another dimension. The illustrations of the main face of my piece have celestial imagery, perhaps also referencing another dimension. So uh, here's a close up. Uh, I've used tape and toner transfers to mask off parts of the surface of the titanium so that when I anodize it, the mask portion becomes a different color, creating the patterns and illustrations. I'm continuing to use my woven pixels along with celestial and creature imagery like the stars and the clawed hand uh, wall mount. This piece has the same visual impression and concept as the first synthetic relic, but it's completely sculptural and more reminiscent of a mace-like weapon or pendulum than a necklace. I've also started painting with acrylic paints on the surface of the anodized titanium to supplement the color palette of the metal and show more evidence of my illustration and hand in the piece. So um, I had been wanting to learn how to make intaglios for a long time and decided to try it out for the recent amend exhibition with secret I the recent amend exhibition by Secret Identity Projects, where artists were asked to make a piece about the hundredth anniversary of women's suffrage in the context of voting in this most recent election. I titled my piece, Hope and Justice uh, in Taglio, because I carved a star on the one side, similar to the tarot cards, the star, which brings renewed hope and faith and justice, which brings fairness. And Taglios interest me because they were carved with lots of imagery of mythological beasts, deities, and other figures to represent ideals or stories in a really concise format, such as the picture on the uh, upper left. Also, I saw another opportunity, uh, similar to anodizing, to combine my illustrations and my 3D objects. So uh, amulets were used as protection in many medieval societies and showed and symbolized what the wearer desired, uh, whether it was protection from general evil or dangers of reproduction and childbirth. So the left uh, would be protection from general evil with uh, its inclusion of the evil eye symbol and the holy rider. And then the right would be protection uh, from the dangers of reproduction and childbirth because it's on hematite stone, which was generally related to blood. The use of the amulets is interesting to me because it is an intersection of material culture and magic. So I wanted to create me my own magical amulets that existed in the context of my imaginary world and its own systems of mythology. I, chose, I choose little picture icons that support the symbolism and story of the overall composition. For example, I chose to include many birds and ravens to uh, represent their symbolism as omens and psychopomps, or flies to reference their association with death, or jars and amphoras to allude to elixirs and alchemy. Taking these symbols, I created similar smaller compositions for my intaglio amulets. Here are some of my test intaglios pre-carving. I use a grease pencil to sketch the designs on the surface so that they don't wear off too quickly while I'm carving the initial shape. To, tool to do the carving. So I wanted to make sure I was still including my vibrant colors despite using stones now. Um, and 
which, ha which generally have a different color palette than the typical titanium anodizing palette and digital drawings um, that I've been making. So I started making beaded cords on vibrant silk thread with titanium infused hematite to insert the colors as seen here. These are tedious to make, but once I get started, it becomes more meditative. And you can see uh, the little gif that I've included of me process and what it looks like uh, when it's uh, all strung together on the right. Um, and to begin the actual intaglio, I cut the stones out with a lapidary bandsaw, which is on the left, and attach them to wooden dowels with a special wax on the right. Then after I've attached to them, I can shape and polish the stones on a sanding machine until they are smooth and polished blanks for my designs. Some, sometimes I start with a specific design, but if I cannot think of one right away, I will see what shapes the stone, will, shapes would look best with the stones I have and go from there. So here is one of my first small intaglios from this batch. Uh, it is an amulet carving of a candle burning at both ends for the type of person who tends to work themselves too hard which many artists and creative laborers tend to do. Um, the notion of making being akin to a magical act goes back to even Plato's Republic where he states that the artist should be banned from the ideal city state for their powers of illusion and surrealists who viewed creative work as a kind of transformation. I think that skilled craft ritual and magic work. In the book Circe by Madeline Miller, the infamous sorceress states that she is only so powerful because of the time spent learning and honing her skills and her craft. Caring for an object while creating it from start to finish imbues it with a kind of soul from the maker and gives it the ability to enchant somebody with intentionality and skill similar to witchcraft. This craft work cannot be replicated by mass production and, in, and interest in the spiritual and mystical has seen a cultural resurgence in the face of looming and dreadful late capitalism. Reenchantment of objects life and the unknown is something to believe in when the promises of the 21st century are largely falling flat and makes the world a more wondrous place where people can joyfully care for it and each other. So uh, you can follow me on Instagram to see where I'm going with this series. A lot of my intaglios that I've been working on are kind of in the middle progress zone. So I'll be posting them on my Instagram when I'm finished um, and also for other projects in the future. So that is my presentation. Um, and okay, I'm back. back. Thank you, Lauren. I, I know if we were all in the same room and it weren't um, this dark time, we'd all be clapping for you. Uh, <laughs> thanks that there was so much there to discuss and to untangle and to think about. And um, just so our audience knows, um, Laura and I are gonna have a conversation maybe for 10, 15 minutes, depending. And um, then we're gonna open it up to questions um, for the audience. So during our conversation, if you think of something that you wanna ask Lauren um, or me, just type it in the, um, in the chat section and I'll, I'll get it, I'll receive it and, and read it and we'll be able to take it from there. So yeah, so wow, thank you so much for that, Lauren. Um, I guess, you know, you and I have had the opportunity to talk about your work. And um, I think I still keep coming back to um, kind of the central question for me, which I think I'll just ask first, which is, um, you know, like I said, it's a very simple question. And at the same time, it's it's maybe like the most complicated question about your work, um, which is how do you account for, or could you tell us more about this seeming contradiction in your work that is a rich and generative and beautiful contradiction that I think we're gonna talk about. So how do you account for this contradiction in which the digital becomes real, in which the virtual becomes jewelry. And yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you. okay. Um, well, like a lot of my, a lot of my initial like consumption of jewelry was digital. Like I will look at, you know, European jewelers work and love their work and, but I'm only really interacting with it in the digital space. Like 
when I was making my first series of virtual body, those pieces, um, half of them doesn't even really exist in real life, you know? So that's what I was thinking about there about how it isn't necessarily a dichotomy. Like a lot of uh, the way people interact with my work is digital too. Even if it is a tangible object, they'll see it on the internet. They might never see it in person, you know? And like uh, nowadays when people are seeing virtual exhibitions so frequently, that's how a lot of people interact with the work too, is they see it virtually. So I don't necessarily think it is a dichotomy. I think that, that it's ingredient in the way that people uh, interact with my work and I interact with other people's work and um, the way I disseminate my work and draw inspiration from sources um, and like bring it into the real world. It's not necessarily like one or the other. Like they both, it's more of like a permeable boundary. Right. So I think, you know, and you and I have had the opportunity to talk about this a little bit before, and I, I think it's worth highlighting again, you know, today that um, that is a really central um, um, kind of form of, I, I would even say like a kind of philosophy in your work in which there's this constant breakdown of this dualism between um, t like technology and the digital versus like the real and the material world. And I think we live in this world right now that is so, um, is, is in the process of, of breaking through those boundaries in really practical ways. Like, you know, jewelry design, as you said, is, is deeply involved with these kind of digital designs in advance that then, you know, get, um, get made, but then there's also, um, you know, digital uh, or 3D printing, and there's all kinds of issues around, around the way that these conversions occur. But for my own thought, I like to think of it almost as like a kind of transubstantiation, like these, these ideas, you know, which we think of these technological ideas, these digital ideas that we think of as so much kind of techno capitalism like oh well you know the video game designers in silicon valley are all sitting around making these things like that really disenchanted version of video games i think that's something your work is challenging and you're saying well actually there's something really enchanting about this digital world that we can transubstantiate we can we can turn it into something real that has a kind of spiritual heft to it yeah, yeah, I, I think that um, yeah, I was talking about like re-enchantment at the end of the world. I'm not at the end of the world. I was re talking about re-enchantment at the end of my uh, presentation. Um, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, there ha there's been a lot of more interest in like magical stuff lately, even if it's just like, you know, people talking about astrology, you know, um, and the you, you mentioned like the idea of like capital like capitalism like all these people in Silicon Valley making like technology and things and you know I was thinking about like well, how how can I keep talking about technology when it's like so closely related to capitalism which I'm not really a big fan of um, and I was thinking well maybe it can be something a little bit more uh, how you know alchemy used to be science you know back you know way back when. Yeah, that's also a super interesting point. And I think, um, again, your work is bringing up this breakdown of this dualistic way of thinking about, you know, science versus spirit, right? Um, technology versus magic to show, in fact, that these things um, have histories that, that, um, that are deeply intertwined, right? And, you know, I think when you, for example, when you show the anodizing process, right, of your, of the titanium, like, that is literally magic, right? Like, yeah, it's like so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, and it's also, um, it's something we can describe with science. But in fact, you know, um, no one could deny that there's a kind of um, otherworldliness to that um, transformation before your eyes. So, mm -hmm. Um, I'm really interested in this as a scholar because um, I, I, I partly like study the history of science and the history of romanticism, which is often thought of as a kind of reaction to science or a re-enchantment -enchant movement. And I think 
the reason I'm so interested in it is because I grew up in a family um, of scientists. My parents were both scientists at Carnegie Mellon University. And I learned that the world was just like this ones and zeros, like DNA plays <laughs> with like no soul. And um, I, there was this, my dad, just very briefly, like my dad did, did his science experiments for my experiment for my kindergarten class one time. And he like made this black goop and it was like, it turned blue and it was like this taffy glass like substance and we each got to hold it. And I'm sure it was like very dangerous, but in any case, I it just- sounds like something kindergartners would love. <laughs> it, we all loved it. But I just remember thinking like the distance between science and magic is actually very, very um, slim. And actually they might be the same thing. So to that end, just to ask you specifically about about your work, like what, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I just want to say like, what, what is alchemy to you? What is your digital alchemy? I guess that's how I would ask it. Hmm. Um, well, I guess like alchemy was generally like transforming things you know transforming like lead to gold or something um and so if i'm doing any sorts of transformation it would be taking like the materials and making objects like i said that i've spent so much time and attention with that they you know have part of me in them and uh are now something like crafted with skill and you know a little, little, all my care that I can put into you know, in time. Like we only, it's like time is not a renewable resource. So I'm like giving something up to transform all these raw materials into objects that will be loved, hopefully, and that I've loved while I've made them. Um, and wow. yeah. Yeah. So your sorcery or your magic over your craft, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's like you're making this sort of jewelry that has this aesthetic technology, I mean, this technology aesthetic, but in fact, for you, there's something really soulful about these works. Yeah. Well, so the series that I'm doing now, um, I've been trying to make something a little bit more tangible that's influenced by my digital illustrations. So it's a little bit more of a bridge. Um, but the, all the like technology and digital stuff is me building out this world that I'm thinking of these objects in. So they exist within like a larger, uh, you know, system of, of story and uh, like world building and uh, mythology. You know, I was talking about how in the triptych that I drew, all the different um, areas of my piece were like different, inspired by different mythologies, like, I, I don't know, the underworld or, you know, um, heaven, so. And so just to pick onto a piece of something else that you said earlier, which is like, or not pick onto it, but, but latch onto it. Like you said, it's almost like you, you give your attention or you give like a piece of yourself goes into these works because they're craft. Yeah. I think all, I think all craft people do that, even if they're not necessarily relating it to, you know, anything supernatural. I think everyone who's making something puts a piece of themselves in it. Mm -hmm. And, and how does that process work for you? Just to like keep diving into that question. Cause I think that's really interesting in terms of the aesthetics of technology, which is often viewed as such a kind of like an alienating, even anti-craft kind of aesthetic. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, um, like I said, when I was talking this, when you, when craft people make something, it's not something that can really be re reproduced by like mass production um, and, uh, I think in that way, it's not alienating, but um, like when I am making things like the, the intaglias, I, no one taught me how to do that. I, I like looked on YouTube and taught myself how to do that. And so doing all these different materials and skills is like, I'm continually learning and that takes a lot of time and attention and um, you know, vulnerability to like try a new skill and like figure it out and, you know, do a lot of material tests and uh, I think when I'm making like either something 
that I haven't made before, like when I started doing my illustrations, even though those were digital, I was still spending time and attention on them, even though it still wasn't a tangible object. So I think those are even crafted. I mean, even if they're not crafts, like I'm still crafting them with part of me. So it's like your attention to the craft gives these pieces a part of you or endows them with a part of you or a kind of piece of your soul or something. And I, you know, I, I told you before, I think that's really interesting in part because it reminds me of the attention that we give to video games that, you know, we have to sit and watch video games and become part of that world and project or endow even like our feeling of spirit into the characters we inhabit um, through the video game technology. So again, bridging the virtual to um, the real as it were. Yeah, and like another thing about, you know, like, I don't know, like playing video games is not necessarily considered like productive time in, you know, the con like concept of like productivity nowadays. And like, I mean, maybe not all the material experiments that I do are considered productive time either, you know, like a lot of this stuff that I'm interested in is not really uh, approved by like the productive idea of a person in you know capitalist society so can you tell us a little bit more about your jewelry specifically before we open it to the audience in just a couple minutes um like the chains that go around your necklaces are those something that you make yourself as well as the the medallion or the um the pendant so um some of them are the the one the like on the big pendulum and like the one with the other like wall wall like wall thing those chains I did make um because I was really interested in like chain making and like steel chain making after I took that steel fabrication class at Peter's Valley but some of the other ones um on like my earlier pieces I purchased the chains and then maybe like polished them up a little bit differently or like analyzed them if they were titanium and so I might have done like a treatment to them or I might have just purchased them because they uh you know supported the atmosphere like of the spaceships that I was going for with those like the ball chain specifically on um, that, like the pink spaceship thing that I made, that one I just purchased, but because I liked how it supported the um, like industrial. Uh, yeah, chain, chains are really hard to make, right? So yeah, they're they, fun they though. Really they're fun. They're like in the way that um, those beading, beaded cords I made are like really meditative. Like once you, once you get started, you know, it's kind of just a repetitive motion and you can kind of just like do the same thing and kind of like zone out for a while. So could you go back into your presentation possibly and show us the image of that um, work with the claws coming out of the wall? Yeah, here, let me, hold on. Um, hold on I'm not in the PowerPoint thing right now and I will share my screen in a second after so I get to it. I think now is a great time to open up to questions for the audience. So if anybody has any thoughts or comments or questions or um, whatever, you know, anything you'd like to say, you can put it in the chat and it will make it into the conversation. Is this what yeah. you're thinking of? Yeah, Synthetic Relic is the title of this work. Um, you know, it's it's a perfect title in a sense, because I think it, it really captures these contradictions that we've been talking about, right? Like a relic is a really material um, object that actually, um, you know, is supposedly uh, refers via a substitution chain to the actual bone of a saint, right? To the, yeah. to the presence of a saint. It's so real, it's magically real. And here you have synthetic, which is this kind of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something man-made, it's produced, it's, it's um, not in evidence of the real. It's something we can manufacture as part of our modern society. So you have this contradiction right here, um, just in the title. And then you have these kind of incredible claws, like almost like they're the video game, um, you know, design itself is just like poking through the wall, the wall to become real, to manifest or transubstantiate um, into our world. Um, and, and, and they're kind of menacing, right? They're, they're, <laughs> um, but then, but then they're silly, right? Because they hold this, they offer to us this strange, um, um, almost kind of medievally heavy piece of jewelry that I think one would be remiss not to point out. It feels like it, it's something that would endow the wearer with some kind of magical power, <laughs> right? 
Um, so can you tell us about this work and how it, a little bit more about it and how it came to be? Yeah, um, so I, I, so I actually started with the, with the claws. I made them on my computer and then I 3D printed them. Um, and I knew I wanted to have something hanging from the claws on the wall. Like that was my, that was my first thought. And then um, the design came from there. And so I wanted to use the steel because I wanted to make it a little bit more of like a darker atmosphere. Like you said, like it might be a little bit risky to take it from the wall, but like also I feel like when people look at it, you kind of want to take it off the wall. Um, and here's another picture of it. There's a discomfort to that, right? Like anybody who's played video games and knowing the kind of aesthetic of a video game is so succinctly endowed in this work, I would, there's a kind of hesitancy, like, do you want to breach into the digital and somehow invite it to the real? Yeah. It, it's a beautiful and terrifying in a way contradiction that is also silly. So I guess my next question for you is about silliness and or silliness is the wrong word, although play may be the right word, but that's a different conversation. So I guess my question is really about irony or, um, or uh, uh, yeah, or, or parody. To what degree is this work taking itself really seriously as, an exp as a way of breaking down this dualism between, you know, technology slash magic? Or is it, you know, or is it a parody of that and kind of playful and silly and about how ridiculous it is, you know, that we uh, have, I don't know. Yes, could, could you tell us about the seriousness yeah. versus levity in your work? Um, I definitely don't take myself too seriously sometimes, which I think maybe is showing up in my work. I, I do like, you know, a good horror comedy movie. Um, I, do, I do think that um, the silliness in my work is coming from a place of like, uh, you know, laughing at something that might be bad because it makes it a little bit easier. But also, um, you know, uh, I, I, I might be coming from how much I enjoy these sources of inspiration. Um, and the, um, I don't know, I think it's coming from a lot of different things. From how I enjoy it, from how these sources of inspiration, from how it is kind of funny that you do want to take this off the wall and that it might be a little bit scary. But it's really just an object, you know, like a video game when, you, when you're watching a horror movie or something like you're not really going to get hurt, but like you're still a little bit freaked out. Um, so maybe that's what I what I what I'm doing. Well, you know, that reminds me of the concept of the sublime, which is in from romanticism, which is this idea that um, which may be a great framing idea for your work in general, the sublime meaning um, watching from a safe distance the awe and terrifying power of nature or some other magical or mystical occurrence, but you're from a safe distance. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of sublimity to your work in the sense that, so you're, the answer to your question, my question that you just answered, I think really interestingly is basically, say, I mean, how I'm reading it is like you said, no, this stuff is serious insofar as it's sublime. It might be safe, you know, because it's ultimately just a bunch of stuff that you make. It's not really magical. It's not really going to kill you. Yeah. The claws aren't really going to grab you by the neck or by the hand as you reach for the wall to take the necklace off. But it's the suggestion of that is enough. The suggestion of the terror that we witness from a distance as an audience looking at this work is enough. That is the evocation that there's a kind of sublimity, the sublimity yeah. here. I would agree with that. Also, I think, um, you know, make believe is fun. And uh, that's also what I'm trying to get at too, is that sometimes it's fun that you make believe um, and let yourself fall into that uh, other world. Yeah. and. But it also runs the other direction, right? Which yeah, is yeah. Imagination can also be terrifying and destructive. And so I guess mm -hmm. my question was also like, which side, if you have to fall on a side, which you don't, which side do you fall on? That imagination, a la video games, is a good world, a world of possibility, of magic, or is it that it's 
I'm at, it's a, it's a, it's an abyss of the imagination and sucks one into a kind of early death. That's a very, okay. So we can move on past that, but <laughs> I don't know if I would be able to pick. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just, let's put it out there for other people to figure out. So we don't have to figure that out right now. So can you go two slides up the Lauren? Cause I have another question and we only yeah. have about 10 minutes left and we haven't gotten any questions from the audience yet. Um, so again, just encourage anybody, if you have a thought an encouragement, a, um, an interesting constructive critique, uh, a question to ask somebody to put it in the chat and we'd love to hear it. Um, this was a really striking image to me because I think it gets to some of the contradictions, the, the beautiful contradictions in your work. And when I say contradiction, I think it's clear. I mean, the way that you're breaking down this dualistic way of thinking, right? So, yeah. um, so, you know, here is, is the real hand reaching to the, to the static, like the impossible contact that you make possible in your work or something like that. And, but you also talked about the static as this kind of fuzzy electric feeling that we get when we touch the screen. And that's such a, a sensuous, um, affective, um, textural uh, uh, encounter with technology. It's very haptic. So I wonder if you could say something about that. And as it relates to the wearing of a scarf, the wearing of jewelry, right? These are really embodied sensuous experiences. So yeah, what is, you don't have to say anything particular, but I'm really interested in how you think about that, the body and the digital as it were. Yeah. Well, I remember, I just, I've talked about this but I, in the thing, but I remember um, when I was little, I would like put, I would like press my face right up to the TV screen and I would get in trouble with my parents when I would do this, but I would like press my face right up to the TV screen so I could like look at the static, like between my finger and my, and the screen. Um, and uh, I, I, I remember in school, I was making like wearable electronics to try and get at the same thing. Um, and uh I don't know. I feel like that, like, I was just so entranced by that. I feel like if I could get that same feeling maybe in some of my jewelry, then I would have made a successful piece. Yeah. And those memories are so powerful um, from our childhood. You know, they affect us, they affect us in ways that take us our entire lifetime to figure out. And maybe it's your art, in fact, that makes the world where you can play with those concepts and ask yourself deep questions about those memories that you invite the audience to participate in. Um, I'm going to post some questions now, which are great from the audience. I'm wondering if we could go to a different slide, maybe uh, yeah. that you choose one of your works, perhaps. So okay. um, we have a couple of questions. Um, so we have a comment from Cynthia Alberto, who's um, an extremely talented textile artist who's in the Peters Valley show, actually, um, who just comments that, uh, would you say you're a modern day alchemist? And Ooh, she, yeah, sure. I would love that title. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's so your work. Yeah, so, so thanks for that, um, kind of underscoring that point. Um, uh, we have another question from, Patricia Claghorn, who asks um, if Victorian art is an influence in your work, which is a really on point question as well. Um, yeah, I like a lot of the like really uh, dark Victorian stuff. Like I feel like the, the Victorians were really goth and I liked that about them. Um, so I, I don't know how much visually it appears in my work, but I do uh, enjoy consuming uh, Victorian type artwork. Yeah, I think Victor the Victorian time, and especially in New York City and in London, um, there was a huge movement uh, towards, that was kind of an underground movement, but actually I think it was very popular around the occult. Oh and yeah, and like the, the I, I, I remember I, I read something about how they made like this animatronic man because they wanted it to be like as close to God as possible, which was just so strange that someone oh, would want to do that, but... Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a renewed interest at that ex exactly this time and kind of um, ancient characters and crystal balls and 
Um, it's really problematic because it also is entwined with like ethnographic materials and anthropology yeah. and um, like native um, religion. And so there's a lot of kind of really dark stuff in there. But there's also some really interesting, um, like this isn't exactly Victorian, I guess it's like um, the early 20th century, but there's also like the Abramelin and like all mm -hmm. this kind of magical occult um, yeah. textual um, um, like books that are being circulated about this stuff. Um, I, I recently read a zine about um, Oscar Wilde and how, uh, and the like uh, society that his wife was in and like all, all of how it like played into their lives and everything. I, yeah. Yeah, there were like a lot of societies for me at that time. There's a whole like, <laughs> multiple dissertations we've written about this. Um, so I'm just gonna pull some from some more of these qu great questions. Um, um, so an interesting question about your intaglios, um, you carved the burning candle at both ends symbol. So there's a question, um, what are some symbols that you would choose to carve in your intaglios that would reflect social and political issues that are important to you? Hmm. Um, well, some social and political issues that are important to me. Well, I guess the, the burning the candle at both ends is kind of related to that because uh, I was talking about how, you know, people, uh, it's for people that are overworked and, um, you know, capitalism overworks us all. So, and that's an important issue to me. Um, another important issue to me is, you know, the environment and like mean our you know, natural world. And so many of the natural symbols that I would take um, inspiration from would be representative of that too. Um, in, let's see, where is it? In here, I have some wheat, which, you know, was is usually a symbol meant to represent the harvest or, you know, uh, the Greek goddess Demeter. So that, that could be something related to the natural world and my reverence for it. I think it's a fascinating question and I love your answer also and just thinking through that um, those the answer and the question and pairing and riffing it makes me think that the burning the candle at both ends you know is is is, is great as you say it's kind of social and political statement but also just that the whole um, process of resurrecting and resuscitating the magic um, that has been lost through the long march of, technic of technicity and capitalistic and scientistic ways of thinking is itself a political statement. Yeah. You know, that, that act is, and, and, and Matt, like, you know, all of everything we're talking about, like the, the um, like magical thinking in the late Victorian times and early 20th century, like the occult, all these things, the ro romanticism, all these things have always been deeply related to equality, to abolition, to uh, failed projects of abolition and abolition, and there's an asterisk there, but in any case, um, and also to um, socialism and communism. So the, and, and craft is deeply embedded in this too, right? Like the, the, the soulful reconnection to the production of an object um, is an anti-capitalist, anti-modern act. So I love that question. Um, yeah, so so that's great. So let me ask a couple more um, before we, we close our hour together today. Um, so we have kind of, um, we have a comment from um, Mary Schwarzenberger who um, is a fiber artist and is commenting that um, um, the different materials that one uses and combines together in various ways is a form of, of, of alchemy for her as well. So reinforcing some of that and how your ideas resonate uh, more broadly. Um, but there's also really an open question from Jackie Andrews um, who writes, um, what is next for your work? Um, how are you envisioning building out your lapidary work um, with your other material interests? Yeah. Um... So for my lapidary work, I think next what I'm going to do is, is try and instead of like the ovals and circles, I was going to try and carve some like amphora silhouettes because of how like Greek amphoras used to have illustrations like on them. So I could carve them out of and then do my intaglio carving right on them and kind of reference that history. 
um, and like keep using my illustrations in that way. Um, in terms of like how many <laughs> materials I'm interested in, I have been thinking of learning, well, I have a tapestry loom that I've been thinking of learning how to carve, not carve, learning how to weave um, my illustrations into tapestries. Yeah, so tapestry is a really interesting um, um, medium yeah. um, as well as in Taglios, all these kind of quote unquote ancient arts, jewelry, etc., that you're mashing into the aesthetics of technology, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's very Ruskinian in a sense. It's very um, uh, uh, pre-Raphaelitic of you to engage these um, ancient art forms and ancient traditions uh, and not so ancient, right, Bosch, uh, but definitely from a very different time uh, and a very enchanted time compared to now. And to bring your aesthetics of technology to that is, is a riptide of, um, of um, non-dualistic thinking. Um, so I think we're going to and on one last question, which is from uh, Justin Mills, um, <laughs> who, uh, before I read his question, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read his question first. He says, uh, the intersection of past and present in your work reminds me of the ethos and aesthetic of cyberpunk. Is cyberpunk a conscious inspiration in your work? What is cyberpunk to you? Um, I don't know what cyberpunk is, but it sounds super interesting. Maybe it's self-explanatory. So I'm very interested in your answer to this question. Yeah, I kind of know what cyberpunk is. It's like, um, you know, kind of uh, like an underground aesthetic, you know, punk was like, you know, like, mm, like leather jackets and patches and stuff in the 80s. Um, and then cyberpunk would be like that, but like, you know, cyborgs and stuff. So I guess, yeah, I, I was, I'm really inspired by cyberpunk. I, you know, the movie Akira based on the um, manga is very cyberpunk. And that was one of my early inspirations. Um, and then like, I think Blade Runner is pretty cyberpunk. Uh, and I really was inspired by that movie too. So I think, you know, that's probably one of the early, you know, philosophies that got me kind of started on this route, I think, uh, yeah. Great. So I think that's a great place to close on. And I'll just make a closing comment, which is um, just ripping from um, Mills and, um, and your response um, that, you know, this, this, this is the question of how the past and the future and the present are all intersecting in your work. Like, what is the what is the um, chronicity of your work? Like how, how does it deal with this question of time and its, um, its various aesthetic um, considerations from the medieval, which you bring with the intaglios to the futuristic, right? Yeah. Which you bring with this whole aesthetic of the future um, to the present, which is the, the presence of, of feeling the static on the television of, feeling the scarf around the neck, of feeling the necklace dangling from one's neck, of encountering the claws in the moment, emerging from the plaster or the drywall. I think what your work is in part challenging us to consider is how uh, the frame of time is always constructed. You know, we always have this vision of the future, right? I like that you call it speculative, you know, that there's a kind of science fiction, there's a reason we call it fiction. There's always a view of the future that it's gonna look a certain way. Um, there's from Blade Runner, et cetera, there's a way of thinking about the sleekness or the, the, the cyberpunkness of the future or what have you. But I think um, partly what your work is considering is the way that um, the future always belongs to us in the present as something to make, to, um, to manipulate and to um, to imagine with our artistry. So thank you for that and for everything that you brought today, Lauren. That was really lovely. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for your nice words. <laughs>
and thank you to everybody um, who attended today and um, to Elizabeth Esner, the curator of um, the Peters Valley Show and um, to, to um, everybody who made today possible at the museum, thank you. And I look forward to the next um, event, uh, which uh, is upcoming and uh, please check the museum calendar to see the various programs we're offering over the course of the next several months. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.